Welcome, business correspondent Conway Gittins. And I'm here talking with Mike Novogratz. He is the CEO of Galaxy Investment Partners. And we're here to talk about Bitcoin. Is it more a, a, a utility or more an investment? Like, how should people be looking at I mean, people right, on Main Street? Right are now, this. I think Main Street and, and Wall Street should look at it the same way, that Bitcoin is digital gold. It is a store of value. And things are valuable because we say they are. Uh, most valuable things are, are limited in supply, right? Why a Picasso painting is so valuable, there are not that many of them. I mean, if you thought about when I was a five-year-old that a painting would ever be worth $200 million, you'd think you'd, 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 we're smoking something, right? But now art is a store of value. Uh, but can I, can I just ask you, why do we need Bitcoin? I mean, we have dollars, we have euros, we have yens, we have gold. You mentioned gold, we already have gold. We have uh, uh, stocks, we have bonds. Why does the world need a cryptocurrency? Well, and so Bitcoin represents a lot of the energy of this whole decentralized revolution. And listen, the, setting up a decentralized system has a tremendous amount of appeal to people. You know, right now in a lot of systems, we've got to trust something. So if you're in Venezuela, you had to trust the central bank was going to behave responsibly. Well, guess what? They didn't. At one point in Zimbabwe, the, the currency could be used as toilet paper. It was so worthless. Uh, and so if you were in Zimbabwe and you were trying to, guess what? The, the central bank, the government let you down. Uh, in 2008, it felt like here in America that the government and banks had let us down. And so people thought, can we come up with another system that we don't have to trust one person? That trust can be distributed across a, a variety of people. And so the genius of this technology is not one person controls it. Right, so not one person controls it, but that makes this the value of it quite volatile. I mean, just uh, the last four days, we saw uh, what, uh, the it lost one third of its value, and then today, Monday, it's up a, a thousand bucks. Coming back, baby. Uh, listen, the volatility is here because we're still in the early stages of this revolution, this experiment, right? I mean, you know, Bitcoin started in 2008, 2009, really. Uh, so we're, we're, we're not even eight years in. Ethereum, less than three. Um, and so we're slowly getting adoption around the world. There's a there's a networking effect as one guy gets in, he gets his friend and he gets his friend in. And, you know, I think there's a roughly 20 million Bitcoin or cryptocurrency wallets in the world. Probably two thirds of those are active. And so that's 12, 13 million people of 7.4 billion. Um, and so it's still a small experiment where there's a lot of nerves. Prices have gone a lot and we're going to continue to have volatility. I mean, what about those prices? What about that value? You mentioned how it's not backed by any one person. And it quickly, it reminds me of the dot-com bubble where people were saying the old rules don't apply. You know, you know, they don't have any profits, but they have this other measure. And then when the, then the, the bubble burst First. and people were harmed oh no significantly i mean this i mean this is a, a, a Look, huge investment there is risk in 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 this space i think there's a lot less risk than 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 the market thinks for a bunch of reasons listen is as wild as the prices were in the dot-com bubble bubbles happen around things that fundamentally change the way business is orchestrated in our how we live our lives the railroad bubble changed the way we live the dot-com bubble changed the way we live the internet is so much more ubiquitous today in 2017 than we ever dreamed it would have been in 98, 99, right? I mean, literally, it's, it's everywhere. And I'm fairly certain that 15 years from now, decentralized technologies, blockchains will be everywhere. It will just be a part of our lives. Just 15 years from now, what is the thing that makes this mainstream? What is the thing that, I mean, because right now it's on the fringe. What really brings it to Main Street? Well, there are two things, right? So there's a viral networking effect. And so pretty soon you're going to see real institutions, I, I shouldn't say real, more established institutions, players like Fidelity. Abby, Abby Johnson has been a big proponent of this. Once Fidelity offers uh, Bitcoin on their platform, then every mom and pop with a Fidelity account can call up and say, buy me some Bitcoin. Uh, that will wildly accelerate the price up, but it'll accelerate the education and the, inst and the institutionalization of it. Um, when Square or, or PayPal or Venmo has a Bitcoin option where you can buy vit Bitcoins on those, on those systems. Uh, so ease of access, when JP Morgan or, or, or Goldman Sachs allows their 
high net worth salespeople. You know, the, the traditional access points of institutional money, uh, that will really accelerate the, the adoption. Yeah, not just the Bitcoin, but the whole crypto space. So I know we got to run. Um, on December 31st, 2016, Bitcoin wasn't even $1,000. Uh, today it's at $6,400. What is your projection? What is your outlook for the price of Bitcoin? Listen, I said recently that I thought Bitcoin would be at $10,000 you know, within three to six months. That was two months ago. Um, it's easy for me to see Bitcoin at $20,000 by the end of next year. Uh, I see a herd of investors coming to participate in this space. Uh, I see a tremendous amount of talent all around the world focusing on building companies and, and building infrastructure in this space. Uh, I see the CME who's setting up a futures exchange, uh, lots of different competitors trying to set up securities lending and futures. And so we're going to see this ecosystem mature. So there are always risks to, to projections. What stops that from happening? You know, there are plenty of risks. I mean, I think the biggest risk, and I think it's low probability, would be a concerted G20 effort against this system. I, I don't see that. I mean, Christiane Lagarde came out with a very positive speech maybe three weeks ago. Uh, the U.S. regulators have been very open-minded. Uh, they're working with the system, not against the system. And so right now, I think there's a tailwind. Um, we got a pretty crazy president. Uh, you know, who knows, he could turn in reverse and, you know, say something that would, and do something that would be negative. Um, again, I don't think it's a high probability. Uh, you know, there have been hackings. Uh, most of those hackings happen on, on platforms built on top of the system. It's virtually impossible to crack the, the Bitcoin or the Ethereum code themselves. I mean, it's literally like the energy of 18 galaxies times 100 galaxies uh, ain't going to happen. But there have been plenty of weaknesses on people building on top of the code, getting money in. And so there's been a couple public ones that have set the, set the system back a little bit. If you had a whole bunch of those happen at once, people would lose confidence. Um, I don't see that happening, but again, that's Although a risk. Although it does take just a little itty bitty thing to rock confidence in Bitcoin as we can see over the last couple of days. This is Mike Novogratz. He is the CEO of Galaxy Investment Partners. I'm Reuters business correspondent Conway Gittins. Thank you for joining us. It's uh, great to be back here. I spoke at the... Uh consensus in New York six months ago, and uh, it feels like about four years uh, since then. Ether was trading about $90, I think, at the time, or at the beginning of the conference, and I think 130 at the end of the conference on its way to the moon. Um, and so a lot has happened. Uh, you know, I want to start by, uh, you know, Joe Lubin was a college roommate of mine, and ju just telling everybody how proud I am uh, to see what he's built, uh, this great community. Uh, the great business he's built, and so it's just pretty cool to, to see one of your guys soar like that. And so, Joe, congrats. And I want to thank Amanda for putting this on and her whole team because, uh, you know, I've been asked to speak at a lot of conferences recently. Um, usually I speak to, uh, you know, crowds that are just coming into the space or learning about the, the space, and so it's a pretty easy speech. Uh, I have to admit being intimidated here because normally I know about I know more than about 80% of the audience, and today I think I know more than about 20% of the audience. And so you're going to bear with me a little bit. Um, my team made some slides for me, and then I realized, you know, I've been doing this on for 30 odd years, uh, getting on stage and talking about markets, and I've never actually used slides. So I might just have them run in the background um, because it'll completely throw me off. Uh, I wanted to talk today a little bit about, you know, why I'm so excited about the space. Um, a little bit about what I'm going to do about it, uh, what I'm worried about, and then leave you with some predictions because I, I spent my whole career as a speculator and it would be really bad to, to be a market speculator and not give you, give you guys some predictions. And so when I've been interviewing people, either on stage or personally, I ask what their aha moments have been that got them hooked into this space because there seems to be people have an aha moment and then they go down the wormhole and like the blockchain and the decentralized revolution becomes their life. Um, I've had many, but you know, one of my first ones was walking into consensus in January of 2015, going over to, to ask Joe for some advice on my stale uh, Bitcoin and, and uh, VC portfolio. I said stale because if you remember, for about two years, 
the whole space went relatively flat, and I hadn't been paying much attention. And you know, it was the aha moment I walked in and I saw you know, Joe leading this group of 25, 30 people in this Brooklyn warehouse, and they were literally plotting out a revolution. Uh, they had whiteboards with businesses that they were going to disrupt, uh, and there was an energy that was infectious. Uh, I had no idea what to expect when I went over there. I thought it was going to be Joe and a dog. And I found this vibrant room. And what was most interesting to me was the confidence that both Joe and the whole team had. Andrew Keyes had just started there. And th there was not a doubt that the, they were going to change the way we think about business and we do business. And so I did what any speculator would do. I bought some ethers. They were trading about 90 cents at the time. Um, and I went to India uh, you know, to look at real estate and meditate. And, and, you know, I came back and now Ethers at 300, so that was kind of cool. Um, as price went up, you know, I hired a young guy. He's here somewhere in the audience. We got more involved. Uh, and, you know, when you start making money in things, you look in more and more and try to figure out what was going on. Uh, macro guys try to take complicated things and make them simple, and it sometimes takes a long time for it really to become clear. Uh, I had another aha moment just last week. I was interviewing uh, Alex Marcos. So Alex was a Wall Street whiz kid from MIT who left his, his company after having made a fortune and found himself you know, addicted to, to the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, he now works as one of the core developers and, and spends his time uh, literally with four young guys and an ex-partner of his coding on the protocols of uh, the Bitcoin blockchain. And I was like, Alex, you know, that's so noble of you. Like, that's like your philanthropy. And he looked at me and was like, you know, I own a lot of Bitcoin. And so I really want the system to be as good as it can be. And yeah, there's something a little bit noble about it because I think I'm doing it for the right reason. But there's a self-interest in it as well. And it dawned on me then exactly why this is such a powerful uh, uh, tool, why, the, why these ecosystems are so powerful that by doing good, you're actually pushing the price up in the right direction. And I started thinking of all the tokens that we participated in. We bought a token called Funfair, which was doing you know, a blockchain version of online gambling. I started thinking, well, I love the CEO, I like the business plan, uh, it's an easy market to disrupt because when I log on and play against the Bahamas, they could be cheating me and I'll never know. Um, and then I started thinking, wait a minute, as a token owner, I'm like an Amway salesman. I want other people to play, and I want other people to play. And so these tokens, these communities, are really viral networks. Uh, I literally think of it as Amway. Uh, and you've got thousands and thousands and thousands of virtuous circles that go on every day. And so it started to, me to think, by doing good, you do good for the community. So here's another, I promise this will be my last aha moment. Uh, I have a sister who founded this group called the Ackerman Fund, and she was really kind of at the forefront of what they call impact investing. Really saw capitalism as, as a tool that usually works, but doesn't always work. And there were great places where capitalism was failing. And, and so you needed different business models. And she's invested you know, 20 years looking at different ways to deliver goods to the two billion people at the bottom of the pyramid. And I heard her talking about this new business she had invested in, and it was, uh, a high-end chocolate business. And you looked at the value chain of who got paid for a $4 chocolate bar. And the women farmers in post-conflict Colombia at the top of a mountain in horrific uh, conditions who are living in poverty, who are picking these very precious beans that go into the chocolate bar, were making less than one penny of the $4 chocolate bar. And so this business model uh, that she had invested in was going to pay them 200 to 300 percent more than they normally got paid. So still not a lot, but not 20 percent more, 200 to 300 percent more. And as she was telling this story and inspiring the crowd, I was like, you know, this is where blockchain and social good can converge. And I was like yelling at my sister for being so slow to get into the blockchain <laughs> system. Uh, she really appreciated that. And so, again, I was thinking, we have these unbelievably powerful tools you know, this group is creating these unbelievable powerful tools. At the last consensus, someone talked about, you know, 40% of the clothing in this room probably has some slavery, slave labor in the, in the supply chain. 
and how the blockchain could be used to track the supply chain. And it got me back to thinking doing good for the community, doing good for business, doing good uh, is, a, is a very powerful you know, self-enforcing motivator. But they're just tools. So at the core of these tools, you need moral leadership, you need kind of a righteousness. Uh, what I love about Joe and his company is from the very moment he started talking about it, it felt like they were in it for the right reason. They really see this as a revolution, um, and a revolution for good, not just for money. Which gets me to one of my worries. Uh, you know, when everything's so exciting, and there's so much buzz and rush, we all have the angel on our shoulder, and we have the devil on our shoulder. And I can remember it. Fortress, my old company, I had this giant hedge fund. Everyone liked us, and I had guys on my team that wanted to do really illiquid stuff in what was a liquid hedge fund. And so, you know, we created what was called a side pocket and kind of bent the rules. We told our investors, they all agreed to it, and we bought all kinds of illiquid stuff. Well, I got an email yesterday from my old company with my nine-year-old portfolio of crap that we had bought. Uh, and it was just this unbelievable you know, memory of our, our uh, uh, unbelievable um, uh, recognition of just, you know, what a mistake we had made. You know, I'm still looking at this, like, badge of shame that comes every quarter to tell me, you know, my illiquid stuff that they haven't sold for nine years that was supposed to be an illiquid hedge fund. It, and it goes back to this idea of do the business you should do, not the business you can do. And right now, this community is in a world where there's this amazing tailwind. Uh, everyone wants to be part of it. I mean, it, it's, it's infectious. And so it's easy to let greed seep into the decisions you make. And so I would ask each person to kind of write that. It was a John Whitehead. He was the chairman of Goldman Sachs at one point. Quote, do the business you should do, not the business you can do. We've been seeing all these young guys come in and pitching us these, these great either VC or hedge funds in the blockchain space. And I've been investing in some of them. And often I get very excited about the, the talent and the, the enthusiasm of these young guys and their insight. And they seem so much damn smarter than I do. And then I say, well, what's your fee structure? And they're like, well, we're 3 and 30. And then if we make over 30%, we go to 40. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, my goodness. Um, right? These are moonshot bets. And so, you know, to take 3 and 30, you're really taking 40% of the investor's potential profits. It just seems egregious to me at this point. And, you know, I'm not telling people how to run their business, but I go back to that idea of doing what's good for the community will be good for you. We're launching a big hedge fund. We're going to do it 2 and 20. And I actually had some people called up and said, please don't do it. It's going to ruin the market. And I was thinking, no, 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 no. It's going to help the market. Uh, because if investors don't make money, right, it becomes the negative feedback loop. In, in the same way, good stuff is the positive feedback loop. Bad stuff is the negative feedback loop. And I do worry I'm seeing more and more of it. There are stock promoters in, in some markets that are pushing you know, stocks at such ludicrous prices that there's almost zero chance that the investor will ever make money. And you piss those investors off, and A, there'll be SEC suits, and, uh, and, and B, it sends the negative energy. Uh, you look at some of the ICOs. We're seeing some you know, fly-by-night ICOs that, again, don't do the community, don't do the whole ecosystem any favors. And so I ask all of you to be your brother's keepers. You know, call people in check. You know, look yourself and say, is, is, this, is this the right thing to do? Because at the spirit of this whole revolution is this sense of you can change the world. And it's really, really powerful. And so I asked myself, well, how can I participate? You know, when I first went to consensus, I thought, geez, I'll give Joe some money and maybe I'll be a partner there. And I started thinking, well, what are my skills? I, I'm a decent communicator, and I'm a decent leader, and I'm a decent speculator. And then I was like, well, Joe's a really good communicator, and he's a really good leader, and, and you know, they don't really need a speculator. And so there was nothing for me to do there other than to be a cheerleader. And, you know, as I have kind of dove into this space, I figured there is a role. And for me, it has been this bridge between the traditional institutional world and this kind of fun, exciting, and much younger and crazy world. Um, and so... You know, I've taken that relatively seriously. I've uh, been trying to bring people over the edge uh, and bring new participants into, into the space. Uh, I never thought I would actually take outside capital again because being a fiduciary is a, you know, it's a, it's a much higher standard of care than investing your own money. And quite frankly, it's a pain. Uh, but the, the, 
But the environment was so exciting, I decided to hire the best and the brightest, and to get the energy around me, we were going to do it. And so we're launching a hedge fund, and we're building a full merchant bank, which goes from, you know, helping people on their ICOs all the way to an institutional product. And really see ourselves as the kind of in between this crypto community and a more institutional community. You know, which gets me to the title of this speech, The Herd is Coming. You know, a lot of people had asked me, why aren't more people seeing this? Like, it's so obvious. And I, re I remember sitting at a, sitting at a uh, investor dinner. You know, on Wall Street, they have these dinners. You get all these big hedge fund managers around, and you talk about your best ideas. And one guy, he was a 60-year-old famous speculator, maybe one of the world's great investors ever, was pitching gold. And I said, you got to buy Bitcoin instead of gold. And they all were laughing at me. And I was thinking to myself, you know, usually they respected me. I've been at these dinners a long time, and I kind of got booed off the floor. And it dawned on me that, you know, 62, 63-year-old guys, and remember, the bulk of the money in America is owned by people over 60. The lion's share of wealth is owned by people over 60. They don't grow up staring into a phone, right? The, you know, when I, when I tell them that there are 400 million people that participate in an online market for digital swords and shields and helmets. They look at me like I'm out of their mind. Uh, Bill Tai was up on stage earlier talking about, there you go, Bill. Uh, I love the, the, the surfing there. Um, talking about a digital, uh, you know, uh, a digital world, a fake world, where there's a multi-hundred million dollar economy already in it. Um, and so I thought, if I gave my mother digital flowers for Mother's Day, I get a WTF, like what, right? But I'm pretty certain that my daughter, or my granddaughter at least, when they get digital flowers, they're going to have the same reaction that, you know, most of your girlfriends have when you give them flowers. Oh, or if in the case of my wife, what did you do wrong? <laughs> um, and so as we're shifting age, uh, you know, it's just so much easier for people to understand why this kind of idea of digital gold, digital good, digital store of wealth uh, is, is going to take, take, uh, take root. Um, I would tell you that in the last four months, we have been inundated with calls from institutional people to come talk about the blockchain, Bitcoin, Ethereum, the ICO market. Uh, I was up doing a teach-in with some other guys to a 400 billion dollar pension fund and they came down with 12 people very serious they knew a whole lot and while they're probably six months to a year from investing pension fund money in the space um, i know actually that the ceo left that and bought a whole bunch of bitcoin himself uh, you know goldman sachs has been public and we've spoken to them about how they can trade and so with 100 percent certainty i would tell you that the herd is coming And so, like, what does, that, what does that mean for the community? It means a couple things. It first of all means that Bitcoin is going to outperform everything else. And I know this is an Ethereum company, and let me tell you, I have more Ethers than Bitcoin, and kind of, I love this space. But Bitcoin represents the kind of benchmark or bellwether that all this collective energy is showing up in. Because these are new buyers, and it's the easiest thing for them to buy. And so I would tell you that for the next six months, if you were purely short term, you know, Bitcoin's a pretty easy bet. It's going higher and much higher. Um, there's going to be volatility. There's a fork coming in mid-November that, you know, maybe gives people a chance to buy in in some chaos. Um, but the institutional guys are coming. And it doesn't, it doesn't leave me pessimistic, the Ethereum space at all. Um, because... It's a process of slowly learning the system, you know, lear learning and getting involved and getting engaged. Um, but it's important that this space, because Ethereum is valued differently than the way Bitcoin is valued. Bitcoin now, at least in the institutional world, is seen as digital gold. And you can look at the market cap of gold, and you can look at this just as a store of value. And you don't care if it can do anything other than go up, just like any other you know, money. So what's money after all? Money is money because we say it's money, right? The British government recently changed what a British pound was. They took the old pound and they decommissioned it just last week. And now there's a, an eight, you know, an, an octagon-shaped pound. 
And so they said, that used to be money, it's no longer money, this is money. And so the collective community is, says Bitcoin is money, Bitcoin is digital gold, and therefore, I think that's the, the first piece. Where Ethereum is valued a little differently. People see this as, at least I see this, but I think it's becoming more commonplace. Again, in the institutional world of the guys I talk to, as this public utility that all these really cool world-changing businesses are going to be built on top of. And so its value can only go so far ahead of where people's perception of how robust the, the ecosystem is going to be. And so the community needs some wins. The, the, the system needs to speed up. Uh, some of the, these projects need to go from project to, to implementation. And so, you know, with patience, I think this thing is going to go a lot, lot, lot higher. Um, I got three minutes left and I promised myself I was going to uh, end with some predictions and uh, leave a couple minutes for questions. And so, you know, my prediction is this, that, you know, the community has in its own hands the ability to really change the world, to, to, to do the right thing and to and the markets are going to go higher. It is, to me, safer to buy Bitcoin and Ethereum today than it was a year ago. Uh, the people that bought it at 100, it was kind of a yo bet. Uh, and you're buying it now with so much more built into the price, uh, so much more infrastructure, so many more people involved, uh, that I, I just really feel it's a, a, a far better bet today. And so, you know, I can't tell you how high things are going, but I think they're, they're going higher. Uh, it, more and more talent is being sucked in. Uh, we've hired eight people in the last four months, and we've got another three or four on the docket coming in. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if we have 25 people, uh, you know, by February of the year. And so I'll, at that point, I'll stop, uh, say thank you for being here. It's been an honor, and I'll take two minutes of questions. Or no questions. Yeah, he's asked me what the biggest risk to the system is. Um, you know, listen, regulators are coming. Uh, they just are. Uh, we're talking to them in, in, from the SEC to the CFDC. Uh, the U.S. regulators have been very, very uh, good. You know, they don't want to kill the, the entrepreneurial spirit. They don't want to kill innovation. And so they're watching things. But we've got a very... Uh, volatile administration, uh, to say the least. And, you know, the biggest risk is President Trump or someone senior in the cabinet, you know, gets a call and, and changes the tone real fast. Uh, those are setbacks, but I think, you know, the, the, the G20 still could put a real damper uh, uh, in the system if they wanted to. We don't, we don't detect any of that. Um, the other risks are, you know, if there's a big fraud, all these little things dent away at the confidence people have, right? It, the ICO market is less robust today than it was three months ago. It's harder to get a deal done. And partly that's because the behavior around the ICO market wasn't great. And so people are leery of it. And so it's, my original thought was, you know, you got to do good, make money and by, by doing good. Really is this needs to be, because it, 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 that's the way the system is structured. It's what's so genius about it. Uh, if everyone does their part and figures out what their role is, uh, the whole system and the ecosystem grows. Yep. That's a good question. He asked if we think of Bitco Bitcoin and crypto as a as a hedge. Um, I think if there's a real crisis. Bitcoin will go up. There are some risks sometimes, though, that, you know, if people start having diversified portfolios, and so right now I don't think if there was a crisis, things would go down. But what often happens is when there's a crisis and you're losing money on your stock portfolio, you, you sell your good portfolio just because you want to take risk off the table. And so I think in the short run, it is a hedge. I think in two to three years, it will be much more correlated. Um, and it'll be correlated because, you know, people look at their wealth uh, holistically. So uh, I'm an investor in Pantera Capital. And so one of the calls that we were on recently talked about a lot of how a lot of hedge funds are popping up 
investing in blockchain and cryptocurrency. How would you evaluate these new funds coming up? Because obviously they're not all going to be qualified to be able to properly invest in these channels. You know, it's the same way I think I'd inv uh, we'd, we'd look at a hedge fund in, in the non-crypto space. Does the CIO have a track record? You know, investing is not easy and it's an arcane skill in some ways. Uh, and quite frankly, a good chunk of the top 15 coins is really macro investing. And macro investing is psychology and intuition. And it's a skill that very few people have. Uh, it's very different than the VC side, right? Uh, but the VC side has its own algorithm that it goes through. I uh, had a, the great privilege of spending some time with Peter Fenton, who is one of the benchmark partners. And after about four hours with the guy, we were skiing. I was like, that's why he's so good. Uh, just the attention to detail and everything that guy had just knew the space dead. Uh, and I was like, you know, my skill set is so much more intuitive. And, and so, you know, what we're building on our own firm, I'm trying to find people that have experience in VC because I don't. My intuition helps some. Uh, and so I think you look at the portfolio manager first, the team around him second. And then is the structure they're giving you rational and fair? Are they making short-term invest or long-term investments with short-term capital, right? And so if they're going to invest in liquid stuff, they better have long-term locked-up money. All right, I'm being told.